I know what you're thinking, at least those of you in the U.S. Really, Bonanza Babe? You're doing this episode during the election month? Hear me out. I didn't actually plan this. I swear. I have not, nor do I ever intend to go political in on this channel. That would be like the place you get your favorite ice cream from telling you their thoughts on politics. That being said, I like ice cream. And I have thoughts on this episode. You might be shocked to learn that most of them have nothing to do with the political plot of the episode. Stay focused, Bonanza fans. We open on a stagecoach that seems to be lacking enough doors to be going that fast. Thank God for car doors is all I'm saying. It's okay, though. I'm sure they aren't foreshadowing any stagecoach-related tragedies. <laughs> we arrive with this horse-drawn roller coaster to the Virginia City stock footage. Out steps well-dressed city boy and man selling astroturf from atop his head, Fred Kyle. He chats with the hotel manager, Tom Madigan, who seems very friendly and eager to help. Look, I know it isn't this episode's fault, but I'm going to miss Tom after we never see him again. The International House's management really goes downhill after he's gone. Kyle asks after the Cartwright family and one Joseph Francis Cartwright in particular. Would you look at that? We're already at red flag number one. Tom makes light of it, and we cut to a baby in a saloon allowed to not only drink, but play poker. I'm not going to go there about it again. I'll just say that he's going to have one heck of a 21st birthday party when it comes around. There are four other men at the table, including knockoff big and rich cosplayers Regis and Gorman. Regis is standing in the corner while Gorman is at the table, but they're both very much in the game. Kyle spots Regis giving Gorman signals and cheating the high school student that they're playing against. This is where I'll mention that Kyle only has one arm, and we'll get to the explanation for that later. The actor, Cameron Mitchell, has both arms, so this was just for the character of Fred Kyle. I'm not going to go on a representation rant, only because this was 1959. I'll just casually mention that in the year of our Lord, 2024, House of the Dragon had an actor with a disability play a character with one. He had less than five minutes of screen time and no dialogue before he was eaten by a dragon. It doesn't make the situation sound so bad in context, does it? So Kyle whoops both Regis and Gorman with one arm and expects Joe to tell him honestly how much of that pile of money is owed to him. He then takes some off the top and puts it back, telling Joe that's a lesson he should pay for. Notice what he doesn't say here. He never mentions that he was looking for Joe after Joe introduces himself. Then he invites himself to the Ponderosa for some good steak. Like he knows Joe lives on a ranch. Hey, see that over in the distance? That's red flag number two. Regis and Gorman watch them leave while Regis exposits that Kyle is more trouble than Virginia City has ever seen as we go to the credits. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, Haas is getting excited and oversharing at dinner the way I do when anyone in the room at a social event dares to speak to me. Can you tell how great my social life is? <laughs> anyway, he tells Kyle where each of the boys is from, and Kyle never even questions how that could be. Like he knows they don't all have the same mother. Haas ends it by saying something about Adam that has this weird vibe of a stereotype to it. Adam has a natural feeling for the jingle of cash, simply because he's from New England. He also says Joe sucks at playing poker, so I guess it cancels itself out. Kyle starts to go political, now that they've told him that there's a northerner and a southerner living in that house. Adam points out that they left all that behind when they came out west, and Kyle says, Can you leave behind an idea, or an ideology? No one answers but this is my podcast, so I'll answer for him. Yes. Yes, you can. In fact, that's a staple of growing up. If you're doing it right, we all have opinions that we once held that we grew to feel differently about when we went out into the world and learned. It's healthy to get out of your bubble and talk with people who were raised differently than you. Adam having actually done that by going to college, I'm surprised he didn't respond. The dinner ends with Kyle taking Joe up on his offer to introduce Kyle to the Silver Kings around town. The ones who wanted him kidnapped in the pilot episode, presumably. 
Ben and Kyle talk outside, alone, where Kyle predicts the start of the Civil War. Adam steps outside and just listens. His facial expressions say all they need to about where he's be what he's beginning to think. Ben and Haas are in town the following morning, when the Pony Express rider comes in. Haas remarks that no one is ever excited for that anymore. Give it time, Haas. They'll be excited by the time your little brother signs up for the job. Don't worry. There's a mini-civil war taking place inside the saloon when they go in. Ben reads about Abraham Lincoln's speech in Springfield, Illinois, where he says the famous line that this episode is named for. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Ben is reading the review of the speech from a northern paper, and Kyle offers to read it from a southern one. The article seems to just be stating the facts when the southern man from earlier calls it fake news, basically. Kyle says he agrees with the article's praising of the thinking of old Abe Lincoln. Again, not going to get political here, but you can think for yourself how familiar this two different news outlets thing sounds. When Kyle gets back to his hotel room, because Cartwright's never invited him to stay with them, he's met by Regis, Gorman, and a knife. They want to sign up to be his bodyguards. Regis was in Kansas at the same time Kyle was stirring up dust there. They both wind up getting bruised before Kyle hires them on. Regis says he doesn't care about the war one way or the other. Kyle says, it doesn't matter to you, do it. I guess that's a misspeak and they just left it in because the rest of Kyle's speech is pretty eloquent The rest for the remainder of the episode. Either way, Regis and Gorman aren't concerned that if one side or the other wins this thing, the world might be radically different when it's over. When that dust clears, all will be well so long as Regis gets his money. In the very next scene, Adam is looking for Kyle. He asks Tom and Tom tells Adam Kyle is alone until they both watch Regis and Gorman walking out while loudly discussing the money tree that is Fred Kyle. No, he's AstroTurf, not a money tree. I said this already. Anyway, you're not supposed to be talking so loud. The Cartwrights have that trademarked. Only they are allowed to talk so loud everyone hears what they're saying. Even then, they're only allowed to do it when there's large sums of money involved. Tom tells Adam that Kyle was looking for Joe from the beginning and warns Adam that it might be an issue. You think? So Adam buys Kyle's thugs, or bodyguards, a drink and tries to get them to spill on their boss. Adam and Regis go a couple of rounds of verbal sparring before Adam heads home. Ben thinks that Joe is with him and then tells him that he told Joe he could go out with Kyle again. Adam throws down his hat, the universal sign for he is over this crap. I gotta say, I'm with Adam on this one, and not just because he does that thing where his eyes seem to change shape when he's mad, and it's slightly scary, but also not not because of that. Adam breaks down the obvious for his father, which causes him to go into protective paw mode. Finally. Joe and Kyle meet with a man named Hennessy who refuses to do business with a southern sympathizer who is quite frankly shady as the ground under a ponderosa pine. Plus, Hennessy has a contract with someone else. There are laws, after all. After he leaves, Kyle gives Joe a present. He's carrying around a small portrait of the woman that's in everybody's hotel rooms and on the walls literally everywhere in Virginia City. Oh, wait. Okay, I'm being told that's Joe's mother. This looks nothing like Felicia Farr, but okie doke. Hey, wait a minute. Has he been carrying around a photo of Marie? What the Sam Hill is that? And here we have arrived at the biggest, reddest flag ever made. Joe is rendered so emotional by the photo of the stock footage lady that he never asks anything else about it. I'm wondering what the timeline is for this, because we'll find out later that he's been married a long time. At least as long as Joe's been alive. Did he have something with Joe's mother when they were both married? What, what's going on here? If any of you caught that and have different ideas, please let me know, because that genuinely dumbstruck me. Mike's thumb scar that you can see while he holds the frame is mentioned in a later episode a few seasons later. Little through lines like that are really cool. Ben waits for Kyle in the lobby of the hotel, and there's a lady already there. 
They dance around the fact that they both know Kyle, but aren't going to say how, when he offers her a cup of coffee. Lily Van Cleet is fascinated by Ben having so many sons, and he's all too happy to tell her all about each of them. She then says her husband and son were both killed a year ago. What was her son's name, you may be asking? Yeah, it's Joseph. Put a sewing needle in that one. It's gonna matter, I promise. Kyle walks in and asks her to wait for him while Ben says what's on his mind. Ben tells him to stay away from Joe in a moment that honestly had me cheering. He also seems to suspect for a hot second that something was up with him and Marie. Again, I wonder if he thought about the timing for that, too. He watches Kyle's body language as he goes back to Lily. The show waits until they show us that the two have spent the night in the same hotel room to tell us that they've actually been married to each other for 20 years. Van Cleet is her maiden name that she gave to distance herself from whatever hubby's been getting up to. We find out that she's the daughter of a northern senator and believes what she was always taught to believe. How many of us take a lifetime to let go of things we were taught because it feels wrong to explore other ways of thinking? But also, how freeing is it to form your own identity and have your own views? Sadly, she seems unable to do either one and is either on her father's side or her husband's. Kyle gets angry and after cooling down a bit, sends her away. He finds out later that night that Hennessy is taking a trip of his own to alert the authorities in Washington to Kyle's misdeeds. Kyle threatens him not to try it. Hennessy walks out and Kyle calls his henchmen over to him. We cut away from what he tells them to do, and in the next scene, Regis seems to get the idea to put a boulder somewhere that will be too hard for the driver of the stage to stop by the time he sees it. The intended target is killed, but so is Mrs. Kyle. With that, the last person Fred Kyle has ever loved is gone, sacrificed to the cause. Adam starts asking questions heatedly as they stand over the wagon containing her body. Joe jumps in to defend Kyle. Of course, they go at it until Ben reminds them that they are standing over a dead woman. So lest I be accused of always taking Adam's side, I want to say here that I don't think he handled this as well as he could have. Instead of telling Joe what he's found out and why he's suspicious, he just keeps telling Kyle to tell him. This scene wasn't handled with character growth in mind. It was handled with furthering the plot in mind. We need tension between the two brothers to illustrate the war narrative. We could have gotten that, though, if Adam had come to Joe with what he knew and Joe just didn't believe him. We could have had Kyle tell Joe that Adam's just an angry Yankee. We know that Regis and Gorman think that the only good Yankee is a dead Yankee. Kyle must have really thought it. As it stands, though, we never get any direct conflict between Kyle and Adam except when Adam makes ex accusations that Kyle doesn't really respond to enough. Kyle finds Regis and Gorman in the saloon, where they quickly take credit for the accident, like they think Kyle will be proud. And you know what? Why wouldn't they think that? They don't know that Kyle's wife was on that stage. And what did he say to them when we cut away after Hennessy threatened to turn Kyle in? Anyway, he kicks both of their butts, and we never see them again. We hear in the next scene that the sheriff, yes, there is one this time, found their tools. Kyle already told him that he thinks it was them. Okay, here's where I can see the merits of Adam's argument. He asks why Kyle thought it was them. He must have known why they did it. Joe's tired of it by that point and defends Kyle again. In fairness, it's Adam who shoves Joe first. Ben breaks it up again. This time, the damage has been done. Off screen, Joe comes and gets his stuff. He tells his brothers that he's moving into town. He doesn't tell his father this because Ben's uh, taking a nap? The pressure's getting to him, I guess. There's a spoof video someone made a long time ago about this episode, and it's still here on YouTube. It's hilarious. I'll try to find it and link it in the comments. It shows the episode with Adam's POV and thought bubbles above his head, and his remarks when Ben's taking a nap are so funny. <laughs> Adam decides that it wasn't fair of Joe to leave off screen, so he does his dramatic exit in front of all of us. What a guy. All kidding aside, his speech kills me every time. Especially when he says, it's little Joe or me, 
and he needs you more than I do. When he shoves Ben out of the way and Ben's nearly in tears, I am just done for. Lauren's acting is perfect. Haas, again, being the only good child, says that maybe Mr. Lincoln's speech about a house divided is talking about them. And Ben says, Not us, Haas. Not us. Ben takes action to save his family. He finds Joe and Kyle in their little conference room with some of the men Kyle wants silver from. Ben walks in and straight up clears that room. He confronts Kyle and subtly tells Joe that Adam left. When he makes Kyle mad enough, Kyle picks up a heavy candlestick to hit Ben. Joe now sees where this man's path has taken him, where he too might have been led. He knows his place now. He knows what he must do. Adam is on top of sport looking at the beautiful Lake Tahoe when Joe rides up and gives him an adorable speech about how Adam's always been the grown-up and they need him. He even pooches his lip. It's so cute. They go home together. When they dismount in the yard, Adam throws his blanket back at Joe over his shoulder. Ben puts his arm around Hoss and the family is whole again. This is one of those episodes with a timeless lesson. Though we may have differing political ideas, family is still family. Humans are still human. That's what makes Bonanza relevant all these years later. By the time this video comes out, the show will have celebrated its 65th birthday. The core values never change. During a heated time in our nation's fraught political divide, I posted Adam's speech to my Facebook page. Someone who also watches the show assumed my beliefs and argued with me that the show is just fiction and what they say has no bearing on current issues. This, I believe, was wrong. Media tells a story. The best media makes a statement. Bonanza fans come from all walks of life. Countries all over the world are home to die-hard fans just like me. Political trouble, it's a madness, Pa. You find yourself saying things you don't mean, things you don't even believe. We should all try to be a little kinder to each other. Regardless of what political party is in power after this election ends, we have the ability to show love no matter what happens. We control us. Cameron Mitchell as Kyle does a fantastic job, especially in the end when he finally snaps on Ben. Both John Anderson as Gorman and Stacey Harris as Regis will be back. I personally prefer both as good guys, but they did this one pretty well too. Marianne Stewart as Lily didn't have much screen time, but she was a sweetheart and I felt bad when she died. Dan Riss as Tom Madigan was great and he'll be back too as other non-center characters. As a commentary on political divide among family, friends, and strangers, this one did a great job. As a commentary on the Civil War, others later on will do better. I do enjoy this one a lot. Let me know what you think.